<laughs> We're live. Um, hi, and welcome to Red Reviews uh, with Justin Clark and uh, yeah, myself. <laughs> hi, Corey. How's it going? I'm uh, all right. I'm still uh, getting b- back into the swing of the whole uh, podcasting game after working so many <laughs> hours lately. Yeah, you've been. I know you've been busting your hump. I my last couple of months have been pretty busy for me too. Um, oh, you got you got fuzzy there. For a <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, my last couple of months have been pretty busy too. I've had multiple conferences, multiple speaking engagements. I've been all over the place. Been in Michigan. I've been in Illinois. I've been in Seattle. I've just I've been doing a lot of traveling. And so June is like the first month in a while where it's more low key, and I'm very happy to sort of get back into a regular groove. <laughs> Some random gig first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate um, it. I guess before we get into uh, like the, the actual topic, uh, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to say thank you to Kerrigan for all of the uh, book suggestions that they've been uh, emailing me lately through our form on our website, on the website, yeah. skepticalleftist.com. So thank you yeah, very thank much. Thank you Kerrigan. so much. And I've been integrating some of those suggestions into um, into the, the the schedule of events. Like I think later in the summer we'll do um, Paul Boole's book on Marxism in the United States. Nice. Um, that'll be the episode we do right after John Nichols's book on socialism in the United States. So his book, I think those two episodes will complement each other quite well. Nice. Um, so yeah, other suggestions have been sort of keeping track of the things that that. Kerrigan has recommended. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention real quick is earlier this year, we did a podcast episode talking about Mike Render and his excellent book, A Billion Years and His Life um, and Escape from Scientology. He's one of the foremost critics and whistleblowers about the abuses of Scientology. Um, and uh, it, uh, his family has, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> But in regards to Mike, um, his family has has let um, his his viewers and listeners and readers know that he has advanced stage esophageal cancer. And um, so uh, if you're interested in you really like that episode, if you're interested in sort of the whole universe of people who have been speaking out about Scientology, um, you know, this is a time where, you know, keep them in your thoughts. You can always leave nice comments on his website, MikeRendersBlog.com. And if you're so inclined, you can always donate um, to to uh, his fund for his treatments because it's the United States, and you know how that goes when it comes to healthcare. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. We like we somebody, to, it may or may not be covered by insurance. <laughs> may not be covered insurance, and it doesn't matter if you're a New York Times bestselling author; it just doesn't yeah, matter. No. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so. Uh, want to send my love to Mike and uh, I wish him the best of luck and a speedy recovery. Sure. For sure. Well, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's, 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 uh, let's get into the show. Cause like, I can't stress enough how I'm excited tonight. I'm about to talk about Star Trek. Star Trek is such an integral part of my life. Nice. I've devoted many years of my life to understanding Star Trek and all of its various fandoms and different shows and iterations and the ideas behind Star Trek. Um, and so I was like, oh, how can I talk about Star Trek in the show? Because right. at some point, you're going to have to deal with me talking about Star Trek. <laughs> so, um, so tonight, we're going to be talking about a really great book. There have been tons of books written about Star Trek. Obviously, there are hundreds of Star Trek novels yeah. that are based in the TV shows. Um, there's books about Star Trek. There are books by Star Trek actors. Um, there are books like The Biology of Star Trek, The Physics of Star Trek. Um, the, the, you know, the philosophy of Star Trek, so on and on. But the book I wanted to do was talking about the economics of Star Trek, which is something that often doesn't get discussed in sort of thinking about, about Star Trek. So tonight we're going to be talking about, um, the book Trekonomics by Manu Sadia. Cool. And this book is great. Um, now I will say like, I, you know, I'll put my cards on the table to a certain extent. Like I'm a little biased because he is talking about Star Trek. So you're automatically going to get <laughs> somewhat of a positive view for me. Yeah. Now, is he like a radical socialist? No. Like this book is definitely written by somebody who's much more in sort of the like more like mainstream progressive liberal kind of bent. But it's, but it's, I think he brings up some really interesting stuff. Um, you know, so for those of you who are interested in sort of a more like 
in a more actively so either there's like socialist or Marxist like analysis of some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I highly recommend the book fully automated luxury communism by Aaron Bastani. That book goes into a lot of it. Um, and uh, maybe that's a book we'll do later on. Maybe we'll do that as a regular episode, or maybe we'll talk about Bastani's book and live stream or something. It's a great book too. And I think it's a compliment to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Cool. Um, there's also a lot of interesting radical scholarship on Star Trek that's been published over the last few years. Um, and there is a book about Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which is one of the shows. Um, there's a new book about Deep Space Nine from a sort of a radical left perspective, too. And I forget okay. exactly what the book's called, but it's from somebody who's a lifelong Star Trek fan like myself. Um, he refers to himself as a Trekker, and I refer to myself as a Trekkie. Now, people will say, well, what's the difference? Now, okay. there are some Trekkers who will say they will never use the word Trekkie because it's like – um, cause their whole thing is like, well, Trekkie is just sort of lame and it's not cool. And that's not what we do. <laughs> uh, you know, so we're what? Trekkers, we're <laughs> Trekkers, damn it. And I've, I'm kind of the opposite. I've never quite liked the word Trekker. I don't like the way it sounds. It sounds rather harsh. That seems fair. So I, I, I so I like the word Trekkie. I'm, I describe myself as I a don't Trekkie, think you know? that. I don't think that it matters if it's cool or whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, basically they think they sort of think of some people who who might describe themselves as Trekkies as being like posers or okay, something. I okay. mean, or whatever. But they're, they're I find, Puritans about the, the so Trek. I feel universe. like if you're if you're like thirty five or over, you might more often than not refer to yourself as a trekker. Okay. And if you're so 35 and younger, you more or less describe yourself as a truckie. And that's kind of what I am. At least that's how I've seen it online, but okay. it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so um, his uh, Saudi's book um, really goes into one of the things about Star Trek that I find very fascinating, which is that um, it somehow has this sort of economic system that is predicated on post scarcity. For sure. And where um, where people's basic needs are met in the Federation and that there is essentially a far more horizontal society built within Star Trek than there would be otherwise. Now, there's certainly elements of hierarchical um, systems right. within Star Trek, right? So like, you know, on the other end of this, like I've re I remember David Graeber referring to Star Trek one time as like space Leninism, where <laughs> – yeah. Because yeah. he was like, he was like, there's, there's all these people in uniforms and there's ranks and stuff, but he's like, but you never really see a lot of democracy going on. There's not a lot of like people taking votes and yeah. like, just people doing stuff. There's not tends to be a lot of democracy. Where's the regular people? <laughs> Where's the regular people in Star Trek? And I think that is a fair critique um, in the sense that when, when you're watching Star Trek, the people you see in the show are essentially very exceptional people. They're mm. people who are the smartest, the hardest working, the most capable. It's all um, military service all the time. It's kind of it's like military stuff all the time, but like the way that Starfleet functions is Starfleet is largely a exploratory organization. It has defense functions mm -hmm. and it's fought wars and things like that, but it's primarily interested in exploration. So, you know, is Starfleet military esque? Yeah. And part of that just comes from what uh, was sort of baked into the, the the core ideas of the show, which started with Gene Roddenberry. Right. Um, Gene Roddenberry is the creator of Star Trek. He had created other shows before Star Trek, but and he created shows after, but Star Trek was his most successful show. And he was a veteran of World War II. He was in the Navy. So there's, there's a lot of naval stuff in right. Star right. Trek. Um, people being called Admiral and Commodore and, and there's a lot of start, there's a lot of naval, um, sort of insignias and terminology within it because it's, it is kind of like that, right? Um, you know, Nicholas Meyer, who directed Star Trek II: the Wrath of Khan sort of referred to, to Star Trek as Horatio Hornblower in space, which I think is a fairly accurate description okay. of it where, you know, Horatio Hornblower tales of like feats of daring do on the high seas, right? And, and uh, it's kind of like that, but instead of being in the oceans on big, you know, n n ships with sails, it's you're in the space Spaceship. and you're in, you're in starships <laughs> and you use warp drive and impulse yep. power. Yep. So, um, so one of the things that I think Sonny doesn't mention in his book, but Graeber mentions in his book, The Utopia of Rules, when he talks about Star Trek, or I can't remember if it's him or somebody else, but once somebody made a point about Star Trek that I found very fascinating, which is that Star Trek doesn't have any brands. There's no brands in the Star Trek right. universe. 
That's there's like there's like the Starfleet Delta, like there's the Delta, right? But like computers don't have they're not brands. Apple or Mac they're not or Apple or Hewlett Packard, like they things don't have logos generally other than the Starfleet insignia, the Delta. There's a, um, a question yeah. on YouTube, like from Kerrigan. Wasn't Gene a Maoist? Maoist. He may have been. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been kind of cool. I do, honestly don't know. What I can tell you is that there's an evolution within the 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 the, the sort of canon of Star Trek. So, and Sonia does go into this in the book in great detail. So, the original show, Star Trek, the the original series, or as we fans call it, TOS, um, ran from 1966 to 1969. Um, 79 episodes was canceled in its third season. The original show was a lot more. Uh, its politics were not as radical. It was still a pretty radical idea. You know, this, this future where various different types of people are on the ship together and they all get along and right. they all respect one another. So you have like, you have somebody like Uhura, who's the communications officer on the bridge of the Enterprise, who's a black woman, you know, who is a part of the bridge. And they the fact that she's black is incidental. They don't really make a point of it for the most part. And when they do, it's to sort of home a point, sort of hit home a point about it. Um, and uh, there's a great episode in the third season called "The Savage Curtain," which has um, where Kirk meets a sort of version, alien version of Abraham Lincoln. Okay. And this Abraham Lincoln uh, refers to her by a word we wouldn't necessarily use today. It's not it's not the full blown N word, but it's something close. Okay, and. Uh, and um, and uh, something along the lines of like he says, uh, where she, he's like, we don't usually use those kinds of words. And Lincoln says, the I'm sorry if I offended you. And she goes, oh no, you didn't offend me. It was just we use different words. And it's this kind of like point to hit home that like there 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 are times where even people seen as moral as Abraham Lincoln had sort of transgressions in terms of language. Okay, that, those are ways in which the show sort of tries to use it. Right. You also have a, a main cast member in Chekhov who's Russian. Mm-hmm. And this is the height of the Cold War, right? Right. And he's right. getting everybody on the Enterprise. And you have aliens like, you know, Spock is a Vulcan. Well, he's half Vulcan. He's half Vulcan and half human. But, but, but you know, you have Vulcans. And then in later series of the show, you have aliens even more elaborate than, than Spock. Right. Um, but the original show had some elements of what would come later, but it really didn't have the sort of post scarcity, you know, what we would broadly call a sort of socialist society. It's not, it's not really built that way. A lot of stuff is kind of incidental. Like in the early show, you get a sense that like Starfleet still uses like currency okay. and Starfleet has trade. And like, there are certain things that they still, there's still certain levels of like commerce or commodity production. Um, that would still exist. Hmm. It really isn't until Star Trek: The Next Generation, which which premieres in 1987, which Gene was very heavily involved in, of course, um, and that's the one with Captain Jean Luc Picard and and yeah. Worf. And they Data. really focus on the replicators. They use them for Re- everything. <laughs> replicators are really important. So that's when he was writing what they call the Bible, which is like the series book that sort of sets the rules for what the show is going to be. You know, Gene had a very clear vision that in the 24th century, which is when this takes place um, in the 24th century, there isn't the need to accumulate things. There is not this, this desire to be capitalists. There is not this desire to, you know, (laughs) um, and that we, we dedicate ourselves. There's a great episode in the last, the, it's the last episode of season one of Star Trek Next Generation where three people from the late 20th century are unfrozen from a cryonic chamber that had been shot into space. Okay. And they are awoken and their their ailments, which were very severe in the 20th century, were, are very easily cured in, in the 24th century. Right. And so they're all cured. And one of them's like a stay at home mom. One of them's a country music star. But then one of them is a full blown sort of Gordon Gecko capitalist. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I need to use your communication system. I need to call my brokerage. I need to do this. I need to see where my money is. And Picard kind of has to sit him down and tell him like, look, like 
your money's gone, dude. Like we don't use money. <laughs> like, um, yeah, we're get not over it. <laughs> you know, we're not, we, we're a society that's not interested in the cu- accumulation of things. Yeah. Um, and so he, the guy's just like, well, what do I do with my life? And he's like, well, you can cultivate talents. You can live life to the fullest. You've been given the second chance. You can become the person that you truly want to be. I and, wanted to be rich. <laughs> and I wanted to be rich, which, which is funny because here's the thing, right? So in, you mean I don't have power over others? No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As some random geek says, you mean I don't have power over others? No, exactly. So he's kind of, this guy's like dumbfounded. He's like, where's my money? Where, you know, where's my stuff? Like, you know, it's been 300 years. I should have like tons of money. What's going on here? Yeah. And it's all gone. He's like the world. Now the novels, I think there's a book, there's one next generation novel that I think brings this character back and he ends up like at another planet and ends up like basically creating like a debtor's planet. Like he, he sort of institutes his evil value, capitalist values on a planet and the, t- and the, and the enterprise crew kind of has to deal with it or oh, something geez. along those yeah. lines. So in the books, they kind of explore that guy a character a little more, but in the show it's sort of left at, well, you know, these things don't matter anymore. And so it really is by the time you get to Star Trek, the next generation where the show becomes very much, this sort of utopian socialist vision where yeah. it's, you know, the, the word socialism is never used. Right. Although I will say there is, there are a couple of references to like far left politics in Star Trek here and there. Um, yeah. And this is why I don't trust any little bit of capitalism to exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause if you give it just an inch, it'll take a mile and far much more. Yeah. Um, but like in Star Trek four, the voyage home, it's mentioned that one of the cities is Leningrad. So this was pre the, the end of the Soviet Union. So the film was, was, was uh, released in 86. So they refer to a city as being Leningrad, which so in the 23rd century, in the 2200s, Leningrad still exists okay. in sort of the Star Trek universe. Um, there's nothing in canon that changes that really. In Deep Space Nine, there's mentioned that the government of, of like Paris or France is controlled by neo-Trotskyists. So there's like these little mentions here and there of radical politics um, in the show, but it's, but it's always very incidental. Like the thing about Star Trek that makes it, I think, quite radical and quite compelling is that it treats things that are to us extremely radical as a very commonplace right. and just a part of life. For example, you mentioned the replicator. So the replicator really isn't in the the, the first iteration of the show. It's not in the original mm-hmm. series. They still like they still have food basic food rations. There are people who still cook stuff. There's still like, you know, <laughs> people hand them cups of, of coffee and things like that. So like there's still in that in the 23rd century, there's still like people doing certain things like that. By the time you get to the 24th century, that's all gone. And that's part of that's the replicator. So the replicator is this device which can create anything uh, that you ask it to. So, you know, if you want a, you know, if you want a Dom Perignon 1955, right? you tell it what you want, you pop it in, you know. It's a lot smarter than the AIs that exist now. It's extremely intelligent. <laughs> it's extremely like, and it's extremely capable. Yeah. And then, and then it seems like T Earl Grey hot. <laughs> exactly. That's what Cap Picard says on Next Generation. He goes, T Earl Grey hot. And it pops out. Or uh racked geno please which is a form of like uh klingon coffee that everybody drinks on deep space nine or okay. Worf's favorite drink Worf the klingon his favorite drink is prune juice so okay. he has prune juice which he calls a warrior's drink uh <laughs> and um so and anybody can make it they've also made some really interesting innovations in terms of alcohol so in the star trek universe there's something called synthahol which is it's it's alcohol. It tastes like alcohol. It gives you the feelings you want from alcohol, but it doesn't make you drunk and it doesn't give you a hangover. It can't, yeah. it, it's not toxic to you in the way that regular alcohol it's not is. Literal poison like alcohol. It's not literal it? poison in the way that, <laughs> that alcohol is. Um, and so the replicator and, and the thing about the Star Trek universe is that they do this in scale. So not only are there like little replicators that are about the size of like, I don't know, like a refrigerator or about the size of like a, actually it's probably close to the size of a microwave. Um, and they can make more than just food. Like if you want a baseball, it can make a baseball. If it wants a guitar, 
it can make a guitar. Which is like why money is meaningless. <laughs> which is why money is meaningless. Um, so in the in that episode I was describing with the rich capitalist guy, uh, the country singer wants a guitar. So they have him, they make a guitar through the replicator and give it to him. Hmm. Um, and so Star Trek, in the Star Trek universe, and this is more established like in Deep Space Nine than it is in um, The Next Generation, which Deep Space Nine is the show that took place sort of directly after Star Trek, The Next Generation. Right. Um, and uh, in the same kind of time period uh, is industrial replicators, where there are these massive machines that can do all kinds of things, whether wow. it's like tilling the soil or terraforming a planet or doing all this kind of work. And the way that they've been able to do this is they've sort of figured out the energy problem. Because in our lives, we're, our, our, you know, our economy is completely beholden to um, hydro, uh, you know, uh, hydrocarbons, right? Where we are, we yeah. are slaves to oil. Whereas in the Star Trek universe, they've sort of figured that problem out. Um, you know, star, starships run on, on dilithium crystals, which is sort of a, uh, you know, thing that's made up to sort of give the Starfleet the warp drives, warp speed, so you can go faster than light travel to get to where you want to go. Dilithium crystals do it. Then, and and a lot of this stuff runs on different forms of energy from dilithium crystals, or it runs from some kind of nuclear fusion power or any kind of different sort of technologies. But but in the Star Trek universe, like the notion of something run on oil or right. something run on gas is very weird and doesn't really exist. It's basically, it doesn't matter. Um, and again, that's a very radical thing that's sort of treated as a commonplace thing in Star Trek. Same with the replicators. Um, and what this does is it creates an economy of post-scarcity. Um, and what does that really mean? How do people live? And so one chapter he has in the book, he devotes to, you know, for people who don't make any money, they sure work all the time. And, and it's true. And there's yes, shit to do. <laughs> there's shit to do, right? So if you're in Starfleet, you work pretty hard. And, and one of the things you see in the Star Trek universe are people who work all the time, you know, whether it's, um, you know, people pulling long nights or, you know, somebody like, you know, uh, Chief O'Brien, who runs, who's the chief engineer of Deep Space Nine, who works countless hours to make sure that that place is running because it's a hybrid yep. of Cardassian technology and Starfleet technology. And it's this kind of bastard child. He has to kind of figure out how to get it to work. Um, and he's kind of a mechanical genius. In the original series, that guy was Scotty. Um, mm -hmm. And he was the engineer of the Enterprise. And he was somebody who was kind of a miracle worker. Um, on the In the next generation, it's uh, Lieutenant Commander Jordi LaForge, right. um, played by LeVar Burton. Um, who is the chief engineer of the Enterprise, and he's blind. And so he wears a visor that sort of creates an infrared spectrum scan of the world around him and beams it directly to his brain. Um, and yeah, like he can actually see better than other people. Because he can see better than other yeah. people. The irony is that's really funny is that Jordy as a character wore the visor because he was blind. And when LeVar Burton had to wear it, it actually made him blind right. because he couldn't see. <laughs> so he would do like rehearsals wearing these huge blacked out sunglasses. He had to learn how to do all of his show and do all the blocking. Basically, he had to learn how to do wow. it blind yeah. without very little without very little vision, um, uh, without very little vision at all. And so all these people are working all of the time. Well, why do they work so hard? And part of it is in the Star Trek universe – Money has essentially been replaced. People don't need money to survive. Right. Um, money has largely been replaced by professional accomplishments or what we would sort of call prestige. So, um, you know, if you're somebody who is particularly gifted in engineering, you're particularly gifted in medical sciences, or you're particularly gifted in other forms of, of you know, human life, um, that people often will work hard to sort of satisfy those urges. Um, yeah, you are a captain now. Yeah, right. So it's, you know, and, and there's, I think, a fair enough criticism um, in terms of left politics of like whether that's even a healthy society. I would say it's certainly healthier than us being. <laughs> it's kind of a bit of what we got going on now. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think probably the most direct comparison to our own lives and our own universe is sports. Mm. Um, you know, sports, you don't, you don't really play for money. I mean, some people play for money. But what I mean is that like, 
a lot of it's also prestige. At right? the like, amateur level, you often just play for yeah, the, you play for the, the, the love, love of the, the game, love of the game yeah. right? And that's a lot of the Star Trek universe is kind of run on now. Now, here's the thing: as we mentioned earlier, like you don't see a lot of normal people in Star Trek. You don't see average everyday folks in Star Trek all that much. Yeah, um, you do so in more in shows like. Oh, I mean, okay. Some random geek says, I mean, some gamers do grind rank in their favorite video game for a fl- Exactly. That's exactly okay. what I'm talking about. It's a form of, it's a non-pecuniary sort of achievement. Mm-hmm. It's not about money. It's about prestige. And some of that is exists in Starfleet for sure. Um, but you do, cause you don't really get to see a lot of regular people. Probably the only show where you do get to see kind of regular people consistently is Deep Space Nine. It's kind of the only one. Okay. And part of that is, and and of all of the shows, I think Deep Space Nine is the one that has the most radical politics. I think it's the okay. one. Okay. And, and I might lefties, have to get back, get into that one. I, I've watched a lot of TNG. I, yeah. I, I didn't watch much of the original series mm-hmm. and I haven't watched much Deep Space Nine or anything. And more recently, the one I've watched the most is Lower Decks. Lower Decks. which I, <laughs> Yeah. And Lower Decks is fun. Yeah. But with Deep Space Nine, I mean, there's an excellent episode of Deep Space Nine um, called uh, the, I think it's called the the Bar, it's like the Bar Association or something like that. But Rom, who is a Ferengi, and we'll, we have to talk about the Ferengi because Ferengi are a very important part of talking about Star Trek and talking about especially the economics of Star Trek. Right. So much so that Manu Sadia devotes a whole chapter. Um, yes. There's, <laughs> so... Some random geek says, I mean, there's an episode of Deep Space Nine where Rom quotes Karl Marx. This is the episode I'm talking about. So Rom, who is a Ferengi, who is a mechanical genius, but he's not very good at making money. So in his so in his culture's eyes, he's seen as a loser, even though he's actually kind of brilliant. Um, he's just not good with money. Uh, he forms a union in the bar that he works at. And his That's brother, awesome. his brother Quark, owns the bar. He wasn't just a hero. He was a union man. So this is really important, right? So it's established that – so Rom is trying to figure out – because like his brother's treating him like shit. He's so tired of dealing with um, you know, his brother, like basically shortchanging people, not giving them vacation, not giving them sick time, not giving them better wages and so forth. Oh, um, yeah. That He's like, I don't know what to do. And O'Brien goes, you guys should form a union. And Rom is like, well, what's that? But Chief O'Brien explains to him what a union is because he says, you know, like my grandfather, my great grandfather was a coal mining organizer in Ireland and he fought for the, he fought for the working class. And so he learns all of this. And there's this great scene where uh, Quark is trying to bribe Rom uh, to, to, to end the strike because they go on strike. The workers of the bar that Quark owns go on strike. Good for them. And, uh, and (laughs) Quark, and here, this is actually a great, this is a great indication of the future we're going to live in. So all these people go on strike. Quark tries to replace all of them with holographic versions of himself. And they all <laughs> suck. We can't run the place. He can't run it for shit. Sounds even with right. the dreams. So I feel like Star Trek's onto something there. Yeah. Um, but there's a great scene where Rom is, is almost, Quark's trying to bribe Rom. And he goes, you know. Uh, you know, we have not, but Rom's like, no, we have nothing to lose, but our chains, <laughs> you know, workers of the world unite. He ends quoting the communist manifesto. Nice. I mean, I think it's pretty incredible that a mainstream television show in the nineties, by the way, this is like the peak of neoliberalism, the end of the cold war literally quotes yeah. Karl Marx on primetime television. I mean, I think that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, it's pretty amazing. It is. And the episode ends with the union was successful. They got everything that they wanted um, and in exchange for disbanding. So they get everything they want and uh, and then Rom quits and then he becomes an engineer for Deep Space Nine. Oh, um, he go. starts working for and he starts working for O'Brien. And right. uh, and um, and that's where that line comes from, where where Rom's like, he sounds like a hero. And 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 uh, Chief O'Brien goes, no, he's not just a hero. He's a union man. And uh, I just, I think it's probably one of the most radical episodes of Star Trek ever produced. I mean, it's, awesome. it's kind of incredible. Um, so that's, I think. It's amazing it got greenlit. Uh- <laughs> I mean, this was, and this was on in like 1995, right, 1996, eh? something like that. That's wild. And it's, and that was kind of what he talks about is that 
science fiction is a great way of talking about the real world and our real problems in ways that are subversive enough that the system will allow it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so like allowing an interracial kiss on television in the 1960s, which is what happens in a classic episode of the original series, Plato's Stepchildren, um, where you are and, and Kirk kiss. Oh. Um, and you know, there were, there were stations in the deep South that wouldn't air it. And Gene Roddenberry's like, I don't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, there's a, you know, so it's, that's the, the genius of science fiction is, is that, um, there's a chapter devoted to now that we've talked about Rom and we've talked about Quark, let's talk about the Ferengi. So the Ferengi right. are the very weird, weird outlier of the Star Trek universe because they are the capitalists of the Star Trek universe mm -hmm. for the most part. They worship the and glorify the production of wealth and profit. Their whole system is built on it. So they, the Ferengi are a race that were originally introduced in the next generation. They were sort of, they were originally poised to kind of replace the Klingons as a villain. And so in the first episode you ever see in the next generation of the Ferengi, they're not at all what they would later become. They're sort right. of like these angry looking mean little guys. And they didn't really work because people thought they were more funny than scary. And so the, they, they sort of get the all time retcon. And so instead of being these, um, you know, vicious, like, killers or whatever violent people like the Klingons, the Romulans are, they become the capitalists of the galaxy. So they have, they, their heaven is called the celestial marketplace, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and they, you know, and, and they have like a, basically a version of like what you would describe as a mix between like Warren Buffett and the Pope, um, which is a guy called the grand Negus. Okay. Um, his name is Zek. Who, ironically enough, is played by Wallace Shawn, who was one of the most openly socialist actors out there. <laughs> so it is kind of funny that like this ur capitalist in Deep Space Nine is played by a socialist, um, by a real life socialist. And there are a lot of radical actors within the Star Trek universe, whether it's Wallace Shawn or um, uh, uh, James Cromwell, who played Zephyrin Cochran, who is the inventor of warp drive in Star Trek First Contact, which is the second next generation movie, um, who also has very left radical politics. Um, and uh, so the Ferengi, they glorify the, 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 the acquisition of, of profit. Um, and they have something called the Rules of Acquisition, which is a book of all these different rules. Um, and, you know, there, there are rules like never leave money on the table or, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, charge strangers some, charge family more, like just these <laughs> kinds of aphoristic sort of capitalist tropes. And so they are sort of the human avatars. They are who hu humans are today. Right. Um, and there's a great scene in Deep Space Nine where Jake Sisko, uh, who is Benjamin Sisko's son, Benjamin Sisko is the captain of Deep Space Nine. He runs Deep Space Nine. He's also the captain of the Defiant during the Dominion War. Um, and his son is an author. And he's I sold and he said, I sold my first book today. And he goes into the bar and he goes, I sold my first book today. And Quark goes, Well, how much did you get for it? And and Jake goes, Well, I didn't get anything for it. It's just like a fig figure of speech. Yeah. And he's like, I see I, to me, you get the wrong end of the deal. And so Quark is so the whole show it, it, Deep Space Nine has this overarching sort of story arc about Quark sort of learning to become more and more, um, you know, like Starfleet, more and more humanistic and less and less sort of, you know, bloodthirsty capitalist Ferengi. <laughs> That's cool. And there have been criticisms criticisms of the Ferengi for sure in terms of like the fact that like, so they're the ur capitalists of the universe. And yet they, they seem to have features which to some might be appear uh, to be caric like caricatures of Jewish people. Okay. Um, but one of the things that they do a really good job about is that a lot of the major actors who've ever played Ferengi are also Jewish. So Quark is played by Armin Shimmerman, who is in fact Jewish. Um, I think that's a bit overblown. I think that, um, you know, people who make those comparisons, um, I think there's some of that's worthwhile, but 
Um, but if you really want to see like racial and ethnic stereotypes like turned up to eleven in science fiction, watch Star Wars because they do it a hell of a lot more than Star Trek. Yeah, does. yeah. Um, but anyway, so over the series of Deep Space Nine, Quark becomes less and less interested in profit. I mean, he's always going to be interested in profit, but he's more and more interested in sort of becoming a better version of, of himself, and not necessarily. And so, like the the Ferengi universe, like women aren't allowed allowed to to, to have businesses. Right. They're not even allowed to wear clothes. So they literally are the whole be barefoot and naked in the barefoot and, and and pregnant in the in the kitchen. Like it's literally kind of like really hitting at home. <laughs> this is but your the, this is your white supremacist capitalist yeah, patriarchy. Yeah, capitalist <laughs> patriarchy, right? But there's this great exchange. There's a great episode of Deep Space Nine where there's this exchange between Quark and Cisco, where Cisco sort of says like, you know, your relentless pursuit of profit is pretty pretty horrible. And Quark goes, you know. Uh, you know, Captain, do you not know your own history? And he kind of lays out like how modern capitalism emerged through right. imperialism and genocide and slavery. And he sort of lays all these things out. And he goes, you know, for, for the Ferengi, we never did any of that. But you did. Pretty, <laughs> you know, most of what you humans, because they call them humans. They don't say humans. They say humans. <laughs> or females. Humans. Right. What you humans have done in the pursuit of profit is far worse than anything we've ever done in our history. Which is, and it's this like great kind of meta commentary on how capitalism can be sort of bathed in dirt and blood, as, as dripping with dirt and blood. <laughs> yeah. Some some random geek goes females, and they wear they have these like pointy teeth, so they so they sound like they got stuff in their mouth all the time. Yeah. Um. But but yeah. So like Quark sort of grows over time. So then you, so you're going to ask yourself, well, what is in a society without money? How does the capital succeed? Well, they do have a form of currency. And they and, and interestingly enough, in the Star Trek universe, the thing that Frankie want more than anything else is actually physical currency. It's uh, what they call gold pressed latinum. Okay. So in the Star Trek universe, gold means is gold is like completely worthless. It's nothing. You know, it's like, you know how we have like nickel plated stuff now? It's like gold is like nickel to them. It just does it's worthless. Okay. Um, there's a great episode where Quark thinks he's getting gold press Latinum when in reality he's just getting gold. And he's like, what am I going to do with all this worthless gold? It's not worth anything. It's not Latinum. Anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, so they have like bars of Latinum. They have strips of Latinum. They have slips of Latinum. In order to talk to the Grand Nagus, you got to slip a couple slips in his little collection jar before you can come speak to him. There's all these kinds of things. Um, so how did this, how does Starfleet interact with Quark, right? So in a, in a sort of post money, post scarcity society. So what they do is they sort of interact with him. They sort of do when it, it's like <laughs> they it's, replicate you know, Latinums. <laughs> they sort of replicate Latinum, but you can't. Oh, but okay. it's, you could, but Quark would know if it's replicated. Oh, or not. okay, okay. Um, there, there's but, like um, a difference. But it's very much a story of like when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So Starfleet essentially like they sign off on like bills of lading. They keep tabs at the bar. So. It's sort of assumed in the Star Trek universe that like Starfleet provides them with a certain like essentially like a per diem, like an allowance. So like here's a little bit of Latinum so you can go get something to drink at, at Quark's bar or okay. whatever. Um, so money does kind of exist. <laughs> or you can just get it from the replicator and he you would can just go get it from the replicator. <laughs> this is the problem with it, right? Um, but they like sign off on stuff and transactions happen and trade still very much happens in the Star Trek universe, but it's much more of a bartering system where it's right. like, well, you have this and we have this. So let's switch. Right. Right. And, 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 and the author sort of uses that of a, as a point to saying that like each planet has like a particular thing it's really good at. Okay. And, and so they sort of lean on the fact that they're all working collaboratively together to, uh, to benefit from each other's talents and each other's um, strengths. Um, and he sort of says, and that's how the global economy should be. That's how sure. it should be. Absolutely. Um, where there are certain countries where like they grow bananas better than anybody else, or they grow, or they make metal tools better than anybody else. And um, you know, and I think he, I mean, the author kind of makes a point of saying that like, it's really hard to imagine a post currency society because Money really is the sort of universal because, you know, as Marx writes in, in the first chapter of Capital, he sort of lays out the different types of capital and how you get to the from right. the barter and exchange system to commodification. Um, 
it's really hard to figure out how would commodities work in the Star Trek universe if you don't have any money. Yeah. Um, and if you, and not only do you not have money, you don't need money. Right. Right. And so, so it's really a thing about like, do people get allowances? And so it seems to me like the Star Trek universe runs on a mixture of basically like, you know, limited work and universal basic services where you like, you get free clothes, you get a free house, you get, you know, you get your free food, you get all the basic things that you need. And then if you have a talent that you want to share, then you can sort of hone in and celebrate your talents um, and, and cultivate your talents. Um, the thing that's interesting about the Star Trek universe is there's really no space for anybody to be lazy, um, which I feel like one of the core things about socialism is the right to be lazy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, is the right not to work, to not see work as a virtue, right? Um, and you know, work in some contexts could certainly is certainly a virtue, but in other contexts, it's actually a horrific burden that we shouldn't yeah, have to do. Like, uh, I mean, in our current uh, society, we have many jobs that are superfluous. Like it, they could be discarded yep. and uh, they, nothing in society would actually be lost, Exactly. <laughs> but, but we have people doing them for the sake of doing the job. So right. how does that translate into the Star Trek kind of universe? That's a great question. So that's like, do people have regular basic ass jobs in the Star Trek universe? <laughs> are there and telemarketers the is, in Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. So there are moments where you kind of see it and you go, Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Another bullshit, yeah, jobs. Uh, yep. bullshit jobs book. Yeah. David Graeber's book is excellent. I got it on my shelf over here somewhere. Anyway, but I got my shelf behind me. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, so like in Star Trek Four, there's this scene where you see Kirk and, and Spock and a couple other people talking, and they pass by a guy sweeping the floor. Okay. And it's actually a person <laughs> sweeping the floor. So there's a and janitor like, there. So there's janitors, there's bartenders, yeah. there's clerks. There are people who do regular jobs. But I would imagine in the Star Trek universe, they don't have to do them to survive. Um, they may do them for like extra perks, or they might do them, uh, you know, uh, for other reasons. But it's it's this is where the sort of the logic of it starts to break down a little because it's like because all you really see when you're watching is Starfleet. You're only seeing like the yeah. best of the best, yeah. the, the, the primo people doing extraordinary you know, extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. Um, uh, some random geek says, "I have many conversations with liberals that want a bit of capitalism so that people are able to work." People who are able to work do work. I hate that thinking though. I agree. I feel like in a society where you're post scarcity, which is what Star Trek is, mm. you wouldn't necessarily have to work. Yeah. Um, or the idea of working in and of itself wouldn't really be anything. I think this is something we talked about in Marx's concept of man, where we talked about that great quote from Marx about, you know, I'm not, you know, I can fish and I can paint and I can I can critique, but I'm not necessarily a fisherman, a painter, or a, or a critic. Right. I can be all of those things or none of them. And that's kind of the post-scarcity world that we would want. Yeah. And so um, so I think that when it comes to people doing regular jobs, I just sort of assume it in – and this is what we're going to talk about more in, in – and in I think next episode when we meet and talk about Bertrand Russell's excellent book in Praise of Idleness, oh, yeah. Yeah. where he proposes a society where it essentially has a four-day – a four-hour workday. Not a four-day work week, a four-hour work day where you work for four hours and then you have the rest of your day to do whatever you want. Yep. Um, and I think some of that's a fair bargain, right? Like if you could work for four hours a day for a certain days a week, probably five days a week or whatever, or four days a week. Um, and then you get all the universal basic services because we no longer need to have scarcity. We're beyond scarcity, right? Yeah. And like, and the thing is, is, and this is the point that Manu Sadia makes in his book and Bertrand Russell makes it in his book, which is that we're already getting to this place. Like this idea of Treconomics as being so far in the future is not actually true. Right. There's so much that we could do right now that could fulfill what Star Trek does, yeah. right? We have a lot if of imposed about, scarcity right now. We have tr a tremendous amount of artificial and imposed scarcities. If you think about the videos of like Panera Bread throwing out bread that they made or clothing stores putting, you know, you know, taking box cutters to clothing and then throwing it in the trash because, yeah. you know, because every production has made everything so damn cheap that no one would need to necessarily work all the time. There's no need for people to work all the time. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, I would imagine the Star Trek universe, it's basically you work when you want to. You know, it really is, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. It's very much if you want to work, if you can work, that's great. If you don't, that's fine too. Um, but but the universal basic services we provide will still be there. And, and if you're not necessarily going to work four hours a day, then maybe you're going to cultivate your talents. Like maybe you become a tutor. Maybe you teach kids how to do math. You or might you, actually have time to read a book. <laughs> you might actually have time to read a book or go to a, go to a book a book club or yep. go to a, or, or audit some classes at Starfleet yeah. Academy or, you know, or because you you're know, not paying thousands of dollars a month dollars to do it. Right. <laughs> and the thing about, and the thing about Star Trek and the way that Star Trek universe is set up is it's all public. There's, there's very little private in the Star Trek universe outside of the Federation. Yeah. The, the, in other places, there are more sort of private enterprise like there would be in, like the on Ferenginar, which is the Ferengi's home planet. Um, imagine parents having so much time to spend with their children. Yeah. That's right. Um, or 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 conversely, and here's what Bertrand Russell argues: more time for themselves. Mm-hmm. That so he has this great essay in. I, I'm doing a little tease of our next episode. <laughs> There's an essay where he talks about basically setting up universal um, universal public housing with universal pre care pre K. Nice. Um, universal daycare and universal housing, public housing, where um, parents could then have a break from their kids. So you'd get a chunk of the day where you work, you got a chunk of the day where you get to be with your kids, and you have a chunk of the day where you get to do whatever you want. And it's because I'm sorry, but I would imagine most parents don't want to be with their kids all the time it, and vice versa. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. Um, it's hard, he, but it's, it's even harder when you have to work to live. And right. you have to have your kids like exactly, and that's and that's the that's the bargain that we have in our system. Yeah, is that kind of setup. So you know, so Sadia talks about in the book all the different ways that we could build a system like in Star Trek, and one of those is universal basic income, a like universal basic services where we have universal services where you know there are just excuse me where are the people who just don't go without. Um, where he talks about with the replicator, we're getting close in terms of like 3d printing technology. And, you know, I have a feeling that once 3d printers get good enough to do metal stuff where they can shape stuff out of steel, then we're off to the races. I really like making stuff out of plastic now is like fine, whatever. Right. Like plastic resin. When 3d printers can work with steel and like aluminum and concrete, that's when the world's going to really change. Yeah. So like, so the technology, the beginnings of the technology are there. I don't know if you've ever seen the videos where people will see like a crack in like the sidewalk and they'll use like one of those 3D printer pens to fill in the block or the crack I or the fill in a crack <laughs> or the fill in stuff. So like people can already do it, you know. Um, we live in an incredibly abundant world. Yeah. Like this is the part that I, I you know, like we don't live in a society that has – all that much scarcity in terms of basic things. Um, and so all of these artificial scarce, scarcities that we have set up are really limiting human potential. Um, and ultimately it's kind of bad for capitalism. Right. You know, I mean, right. none of us really like capitalism, but like it's actually bad for capitalism too, in the sense that like if you create a society, whereas I think I said last time where humans are doing all the grunt work and robots are doing all the art, that's a society <laughs> that will kind of decay from within. Yeah, that's backwards. And and that's part of the humanistic ethic of Star Trek. So probably there were really two writers who had sort of an outsized influence on Star Trek in terms of what Star Trek was going to become and what it means. In the early years of Star Trek, the first series and the earlier years, the the, the model really is Robert Heinlein. Okay. The great science fiction novelist and, and writer who was a part of a group of writers um, uh, and uh, who wrote for astounding science fiction in the 1940s, 50s. And he wrote a novel called Space Cadet, which is about a young farm boy from Iowa who goes off and joins the Space Cadet Reserve and becomes a space cadet. Okay. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that James T. Kirk, the captain of the Enterprise – is from Iowa, you know, that's a nod to, to Heinlein and space cadet, but a lot of modern track, especially TNG on is really influenced by Isaac Asimov. Um, okay. Isaac 
Asimov is his influence is kind of all over it. Yeah. Um, in terms of robots and thinking about robots. So Asimov wrote a series of robot novels and he essentially kind of comes to the conclusion at the end of them that like for all of the really great things that we want to do in the future, we humans have to do it ourselves. We cannot rely on robots to do everything. Mm -hmm. And because that takes the joy out of life and it destroys the creative spark within humanity. I think there's a certain level of truth to that. I think there's a lot we could certainly leave to robots <laughs> yeah. in terms of like manufacturing and grunt work and shit, but like art, that stuff that humans should do. Robots shouldn't do art. Humans should do art. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so there's this real sense of, you know, I think the, what makes Star Trek different than a lot of science fiction writers and science fiction in general is its optimism. Star Trek is a very optimistic universe. It's a very it's very optimistic about the future. It's, I think it's part of the reason why I love it. I think it's part of the reason why so many people love it. It's because so much science fiction is absolutely fucking bleak. Um, <laughs> it's always it's dystopian. <laughs> always dystopian, whether it's, you know, it's Philip K. Dick or William Gibson or whatever. It's very, it can be very, very dystopian. And Star yeah. Trek isn't like that. You know, some of the more dystopian themes, even in Asimov, it pretty much rejects. Um, Star Trek really has a belief in the future, which is something that I think we on the left should have too. I think it's I think it's important for us to not just complain about how things are and sure. be kind of brooding, although some of that's important, right? You know, as, as we said of as as Marx's daughter said of him, he hated so profoundly because he loved so deeply, right? Mm -hmm. Or he hated so deeply because he loved so profoundly. You know, love and hate are not antithetical to one another. A sense of love for your fellow man can in, can induce a tremendous amount of hatred in in you about the the, the evil sort of capitalist system. Yeah, the things that um, harm them. The things that harm them. Um, but Star Trek really has this future of radical hope. Um, and uh, Renegade Cut, one of my favorite YouTube channels, um, great channel, did an episode a while back about um, Star Trek and radical hope. And he sort of talked about that within the context of indigenous people's rights and, oh, and talking about the ideas of radical hope. I encourage people to check it out. I don't think I've seen that one. Um, but his general conclusion, um, yes, exactly right. Some random geek says, I hate capitalism with the passion because of the suffering it causes my friends. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, or just on a purely selfish level, I hate capitalism because the suffering it, it brings upon me. Right. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, you know? That's right. I mean, I think like, this is the thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's in your rational self-interest to be a socialist. Yeah. You know, like it's, if you want to get all Randian about it, but it's true. Like, you know, there's no, you know, because you think that if you think it's rational to screw somebody over for your last dollar, then other people will think that too. And if you build a world where everybody's trying to screw everybody else, you create a world of untold human misery, which yeah. is pretty much pretty much where we live now. And so <clears throat> I think that's really what makes Star Trek's you know vision of the future really positive. And it really is built upon the way that they get to that optimistic, hopeful future. <laughs> um, my, <some laughs> geek said, my retirement plan is communism or death. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's absolutely fair. Yeah. Um, um, you know. I do uh, have an RSP though. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I do have a pension and, a, and I have a what's called a four hundred three b, which is basically the public employee version of a four hundred one k. But I have to. I move do have. To, a, uh, I have to move to a much poorer country for it to be able to last. Exactly, my yeah, anything worth life. anything. Yeah, um, you know, there's a it's the, the, the Christmas story. The, the movie A Christmas Story is based on a book called by Gene Shepard called um, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. Yeah. Which I think is a great title. And I feel that kind of way about like, you know, um, in communism, we will trust communism, but in the meantime, we have to use cash. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that that open optimistic view of the future is something that we should hold on to and advocate for that, that the world that we seek to build is predicated on that sense of post scarcity. The future that Star Trek builds is one that's, that is very much based on building a world where people's basic needs are met. And that we live in a society where, um, as Gene Roddenberry once said, um, there will be no hunger, there will be no greed, and every child will know how to read. Um, that's kind of how we said it. And I think that that vision 
Um, the other core of Star Trek that I think is really important is the idea of um, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, which is a philosophy called EDIC, which is the acronym of those words, um, and uh, which comes from the Vulcan philosophy. Um, but it's basically the philosophy of Star Trek that we are better because of our differences and not, not, not because of our similarities and that our differences are what make us great. And I think that 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 vision of the future that's based on building a world of post scarcity with infinite diversities is one that I want to live in, and I think it's one that a lot of people want to live in, and one we should fight for. Yep. Um, and that's what makes Star Trek great. Um, so that is Trekonomics. Um, I the book is great. It was mostly just a springboard for me to talk about how awesome Star Trek is. <laughs> that's um, awesome. And I did really like the book quite a bit. Um, I think that. Uh, the author in could have been a little bit more radical, but hey, I'll take what I can get uh, with some respects. That's what Aaron Bastani's excellent book is for. That's what what right. what what I do is for, and what we do is for. Um, so so yeah, so that's Trekonomics. you know. And so you know, I'll leave it with this. So people are like, well, how do you start watching Star Trek? There's multiple shows. There's hundreds of episodes of television. How do you get started with Star Trek? DNG. And I always tell NG. <laughs> I always tell people start with Star Trek The Next Generation. And I would tell them, I would actually, not only would I tell them TNG, but I would tell them kind of start with season three. Is that right? TNG. Okay. That's when the show gets really damn good. Now, the first two seasons have moments of brilliance. Right. Like the episode we discussed about the rich guy or season two's uh, episode of Measure of a Man, which is an excellent episode oh, about yeah. data and human rights. Yeah. That's a great one. Um, there are really good episodes in the first couple of seasons, but there's also a lot of things that aren't so great. The show really hits its stride in the third season. Um, so, you know, re so, you know, pick out some of the best episodes from seasons one and two, and then really start with season three. And if you love it, then you can go back and watch the other stuff. Um, but I would say, you know, start with that. Or for those who have, uh, you know, a bit more, but they want something darker, they want a more of a darker tone. Um, I encourage people to watch Deep Space Nine. Um, I think Deep Space Nine is probably my second favorite show of Star Trek next to TNG. TNG is my favorite, um, but Deep Space Nine is really a close second. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and that one's one that you don't necessarily um, – uh, uh, oh, so Sim Random Geek says my friend Steve Shives. Oh, yes, Steve does a tremendous amount of great Star Trek content. Is curious about how do we get to post-scarcity society like Star Trek. He thinks we need replicators – Technology first. I think some of that's true. I think that there, there, the way in which we get to that to that future that we want, that sort of post scarcity future, it's a mixture of a change in technology, the way in which we produce and consume goods, and a change in ethics. Mm. Those two have to go hand in hand. I think that the potential of artificial intelligence to do a tremendous amount of good for the human race is there, but but the reason that people are so afraid of it is because of the way that our system is arranged currently yeah. um and so uh yeah that's so yeah it's like we we've often said before that like we don't necessarily have a, a lack of production or a, a, a scarcity problem we have a distribution problem so mm -hmm. we very much have a distribution problem i think there are certain things that we could do today to get to that post-scarcity society and yeah. some of the ways that we do that is robust public goods so it's the you know it's the universal basic income universal basic services you know, public health insurance, you know, public health care, universal public housing. These are the kinds of things that get us. So that's like the political component, because I think the problem with sort of waiting for this technology to come save us is not to me. That's and, I, and I'm not necessarily saying this is what Steve is saying. I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. I'm just saying that, like the idea that on just on a basic level that like we have to wait for a technology and then things will get better. I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think it has to be a mixture of both technology and contemplation. We have to yeah. we have to envision what world we want to build in, what world we want to build, and then we use the technology to do that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, some random geek also says, but with Gene's history in Star Trek lore, it was World War III for the massive culture yep. change. That's right. I have. I I, 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 hope it I think it's. I hope it doesn't it does, come. Yeah, to I that. also I hope agree. it doesn't come to that. <laughs> I hope it doesn't come to that either, but here's what I will say to people. World War I brought the end of a lot of empires and also brought on the Bolshevik Revolution. 
World War II also pretty much led to the breakdown of more empires and led to the communist revolution in China. So the idea of global conflicts can also be massive catalysts of change. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that upheavals are time of, of great opportunity. You know, as Mao once said, you know, everything under heaven is in chaos. The conditions are excellent. Um, I think that there's a, there's a sense in which taking advantage of those inflection points in history uh, are important. Um, but I would love to live in a world where it doesn't have to come to that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's a great episode of Strange New Worlds, which is one of the newest Star Trek shows. It's probably my favorite of all of the new Star Trek shows. Um, is there's a great, in the first episode, Captain Pike, who captained the Enterprise before Kirk, um, he gives this great speech about World War III and kind of what talk, you know, how the human race almost obliterated itself. And in almost obliterating itself, it sort of had this global, moral, sort of come to Jesus moment and sort of changed. Um, and I think that that's really uh, relevant. I mean, I think that, you know, hopefully it doesn't have to come to that. But we've, but we don't have to go to wars to experience those kinds of upheavals. I mean, you and I are both, uh, you know, we're in our 30s and 40s ish. And, uh, and <laughs> late 40s now, <laughs> early 30s, right? And um, we've lived through many different sort of cataclysmic age. Okay, so Summer and Geek says I'm 30. I'm 32. I'll be 33 in July. Um, uh, and I always make the joke that I'm 33 and my init- I will be 33 and my initials are JC. Don't read anything into that. Um, but, but anyway, um, but anyway, yeah. So like we've lived through many upheavals, right? So like we've lived through, you know, um, the global economic breakdown twice. Yeah. One from, you know, 2007, 2008 into 2009 and COVID. So we went through that. Um, and we went through horrific wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We went through 9-11. Yeah. Um, so like we've been through these cultural inflection points. I do feel like there's a sense in which people are grasping, really grasping for something to believe in and to have some future and hope in. I think that's why Star Trek is so popular and why people gravitate to it towards towards it so much is because of its the you see the potential in humanity to do good. You know, and even if we don't necessarily transverse across the stars, that we can build a better world for us here. Yeah. And and that's really the the goal, right? Um, so yeah, so that's Trekonomics. Um check out the book if you want to. At the very least, I encourage you to certainly watch something of Star Trek. Um, you know, start with Next Generation, maybe start with season three, or you can start with Deep Space Nine and watch the very beginning of you can start from the very beginning of that. Um you don't have to have watched Next Generation for Deep Space Nine to make sense. Right. Um, some of it will make more sense if you watch TNG, but you don't have to. Um, or if you're into new Trek, if you're watching, you know, lower decks or I know you're watching lower decks and I've watched a couple episodes of that. Um, I'm probably going to watch all of lower decks once I finish deep space nine as like a little bit of like a break. And then I'm going to start watching Voyager because lower decks makes a lot more sense if you've watched other series. Yes. yes, Star (laughs) Trek is lower decks. A lot of the stuff will not make sense if you don't know anything about Star Trek. It's, it's, it very much relies upon that word intertextuality. It's all, of, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's all referencing other like things that are referencing too, other things. I feel like philosophy too, but I think she did a video about intertextuality that was really interesting, but I can't remember or not. But 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 yeah, it's it's referencing other things and having to have seen something else for something else to make sense. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, I think there's a whole world out there of Star Trek that, you know, you, that you find something that you might like. So. Sure. I guess, uh, what are we covering next time? I guess so we next already time, talked about it. <laughs> so <laughs> next, so next time for our, for our viewers, I want to tell you. So next time we're going to be in two weeks, we're going to be doing two shows. We're going to do a regular episode and we're going to be doing a live stream. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do those back to back. So, um, the regular episode, we're going to be covering In Praise of Idleness by Bertrand Russell. Um, I've wanted to talk about Bertrand Russell on the podcast for a while now. I'm really excited to. So nice. um, I think this was a better book to do than Why I'm Not a Christian, which is also a great book. But we've kind of done that kind of stuff this year. And I'm much more interested in talking about um, Bertrand Russell's sort of radical non-Marxist socialism. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we'll do that next time. And then... The live stream, the theme of the live stream will be 
rich people things. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Chris, we're going to talk a little bit about Chris Lehman, who's a great journalist who writes for the Nation and the Baffler. He's got a really funny, humorous book of social commentary called Rich People Things, where he talks about rich people things. What we're going to do is we're going to sort of go through his list and sort of you know, see if some of them hold up. And then we're going to add what we would, if we were going to update the book, because this book came out like 10 years ago or whatever, we were to update the book, what rich people things would we add on it? Um, and then of course it will also be a Q and A for any of those who have questions. So like, you know, probably the first half of it will be talking about rich people things. The other half will be Q and A or however we want to do it, yep. just sort of a springboard. So that's what we got coming down the pike. We got content, so much content for you. It's going to be fantastic. Awesome. And I guess, uh, you can read it on the screen right now, but let's just go through the routine. Where can people find you? <laughs> find me down here at the website, uh, justinclark.org. That's where I have all my um, that's where I have all my articles. So my article on Christopher Hitchens is finally live because that's published in the Truth Seeker this this past month. Nice. Um, and then I'm working actually I'm actually working on writing something right now about Bertrand Russell's In Praise of Idleness, which cool. will be a talk I'll be giving. Um, later this month. And then that'll be an article that'll be on the website too. But you can find me all there. You can also find me on social media. I'm at Justin Clark PH for public history on Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can, that's where you guys can find me. And then I, as I always say at the end of the episode, um, definitely check out the Patreon. Uh, is it, is it, it's, is it skeptical leftist or my skeptical leftist on it's Patreon? Patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Yes. Patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Um, <laughs> Or just go to his website, skepticalleftist.com. Yes. That'll probably take you to the Patreon as well. Corey works very, very hard. <laughs> you know, he this isn't his day job, folks. He, you know, he, <laughs> he does this when the dishes are done, okay? Right. And he works very hard. So make sure you throw a little coin his way. He, he certainly needs it. Can always use um, more. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, definitely check it out. It helps pay and, for uh, the programs I, I uh, Exactly. We're, we're doing – guys – <laughs> we're, cre we're creating some world-class content. That's, that's right. That's what I'm saying. That's right. We're, we're doing some really great things. So definitely uh, follow the Patreon, but that's where you guys can find me too. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Justin. And thank you thank to you, everybody Corey. who listened and watched. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Some Random Geek, for all your wonderful comments. For sure. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me survive, which is essentially the only way that projects like this can continue for me. If you want to contribute, you can do that at uh, patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical left. If you can't contribute financially, then a, a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff and to check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can find the videos I do with my friend Damien Marie Atho, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast, Skeptarchy, and from my newly retired show, From, Ma from Many People's Strength. You can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at skepticallefty. My Facebook page is the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. And my mastodon is collectiva.social slash at skeptical leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Uh, join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets and uh, spread the propaganda. <laughs>